Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to our practitioner talk series uh, at CIE platform. Um, I see some interruption on the screen. Okay, we'll fix it. Welcome, everyone. My name is Prakash Kumar Jha. I'm assistant professor of climatology at Mississippi State University. Uh, it is my pleasure to moderate this session with our renowned practitioner, Madhukarji Swambu. And <clears throat> he will talk more about water uh, resources field practitioners at different uh, location, how to restore the surface water system. He is a research head at Vedic region. Those who join Siahi first time, let me brief you about Siahi. Siahi is a Society of Young Agriculture and Hydrology Scholars of India. A, a community which which engaged with a lot of stakeholders starting from researchers scholars scientists uh, faculties field practitioners growers um, and and policy makers as well so that's how this kind of consortium where we discuss more on research marriage with policy and practice so that's how we discuss more on um, uh, different uh, intersection of research and policy and practice so that's how in that context we have a practitioner who does a lot of work in uh, water research system water surface water system so uh, without much ado i'll request dr pankaj gupta uh, from iit delhi uh, to introduce formally uh, madhukaji so pankaji over to you yeah so namaskar and very good morning and good evening to all of you. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prakash ji, uh, for a nice introduction about Shahi. So as uh, we have discussed earlier uh, in this series uh, that is called uh, Water Resources Field Practitioners, we will have a renowned field practitioners in the coming, uh, uh, coming month. So today is like first opening talk by uh, other near honorable uh, madhukar uh, ji and he is research head at uh, vedic region a llp uh, located and uh, working in india and uh, located in nearby new delhi and he is like uh, he he itself and his team is like uh, doing exceptionally well in the field so our thought was to introduce the audience, especially in the uh, PhD scholars and uh, yeah, postdoctoral fellow uh, who are the member of this society uh, about the field practices. And uh, Madhukarji has already implemented a number of projects in India, including um, surface water ponds restoration, surface water body restorations. Uh, distributed across the country and uh, not only just restoration he has uh, he has evaluated the environmental impact uh, by performing a series of uh, practices like uh, restoration of pond and thereafter uh, the impact on air and pollution so i'm really happy to highlight one case here recently one of his work uh, has been like in the headlines of many news and and uh, in uh, research as well uh, from uh, Muradabad. So his practice over there not only improved this water quality of ponds, but also the air quality. So even after having uh, such a like a huge industrial clusters in and around the city and uh, residents of the area is getting one pure water as well as the air. So it's a kind of a very nice, uh, uh, like a field scale practices. We would not like to learn, uh, we would not like to listen a lot about technical things, but I would like to request Madhukarji to um, discuss about the field practices, challenges, and the way to meet the field practices. Recently, I was in uh, Finland and uh, the, the, the professor was so um, like, um, happy to see the field level of practices. So yeah, we as a researcher definitely would like to translate the, our research to the field. And Madhukarji is one of the like uh, uh, excellent example who is uh, behind this translation of uh, research uh, from paper to, from impact factor to impact. So um, this is all about Madhukarji in short. Uh, we will learn from you, Madhukarji, and try to highlight the challenges related to the field practices. And uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Prakashji. Over to you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Pankaji. So without much ado, uh, I will hand over to Madhukarji. Over to you, Madhukarji. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pankaj. Uh, as uh, you've already set the uh, context for the uh, discussion, so let me just start uh, the discussion with uh, uh, the, the same background, the restoration of the surface water system. And uh, what we also need to understand what exactly is water, what exactly the surface water system. And then we'll move on towards uh, what exactly could be the impact and uh, then we'll uh, discuss a couple of case studies to understand the impact in the ground reality at the field. So, uh, as the context is uh, about surface water system and its rejuvenation through nature-based solution, uh, what you see on uh, your screen, uh, I hope the screen is visible, uh, Dr. Saab? Yes. Yeah. So what you see on your screen is a, a real-time case study, uh, which is in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. Uh, the dates are also mentioned, 15th of December 2019 uh, and 30th of December 2019 in the same water body, which was a pool or a reservoir of sewage water only. And uh, uh, the 15th December picture shows you that the complete water is still, there are no waves, um, there are uh, patches of fungal growth, uh, there's a lot of algal bloom and uh, 30th of December, you can see that uh, the water is blue. Actually, the water is not blue. Water is colorless uh, because the sky is blue. You can see the reflection of the sky there. And uh, there are lots and lots of waves. Uh, there's uh, no algal bloom or fungal growth which is left. So that's the impact of merely 15 days. In, uh, normally, the approach of people is uh, that uh, nature-based solutions are slow uh, in creating an impact, but you can see the 15 days impact of a nature-based solution. Uh, so this is what we're going to talk about, that what exactly is the surface uh, water system and uh, the, the history, civics, geography, uh, biology, ecology, and physics of water. So we're going to focus on uh, understanding the surface water system and then we will move uh, towards uh, its importance and its impact and then uh, a few case studies. So if we look at uh, the history of water on the planet, uh, you can see this uh, picture which is off Earth uh, during Cambrian explosion era, which is about 500 million years ago. Uh, that time the surface was getting created. Uh, as we all know, 73% of the planet is water and the life began in ocean. Those, these are the fact that almost everybody, uh, at, le at least every science student knows, right? Uh, so there was a huge role of the microbial life because when, uh, even before the Cambrian explosion era, even before when the water was formed, uh, the 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 entire planet was a mix of poisonous gases this was transformed into a livable planet due to the metabolic activities of the microbes right because they can survive in the harshest of the condition they can perform the metabolic activities and due to which there is uh, a lot of um, synthesis of the poisonous gases and the uh, temperature and everything is maintained and, and that is how the the uh, terrestrial surface of the earth started uh, being formed and uh, Cambrian explosion era there was a very uh, fast evolution of life which was happening but it was all happening in the oceans from the oceans uh, to the terrestrial life there was a lot of changes which was happening on the planet and life propagated from oceans towards terrestrial life and this propagation was actually uh, creating a demand for a completely new ecosystem because into oceans, all the plants, all the animals, all the microbial life is absolutely fine with the salinity of water. But in terrestrial uh, life forms, the need was very different. So that is why there was a need of sweet water sources. And that's how nature created a completely new ecosystem 
on the surface, on the terrestrial life, uh, which created the landlocked water bodies. Now, why are landlocked water bodies required is the answer uh, gives you the answer for the new kind of these life forms could not sustain the salinity of the marine water. So that is where sweet water ecosystem was required. And that is where landlocked water bodies were created. Now, these landlocked water bodies have got huge number of ecosystem services to provide for maintaining the terrestrial life form. You, me, all uh, birds and animals and insects and plants which are there on terrestrial uh, uh, land masses, they have a specific need and all these needs are fulfilled by the landlocked water body that we will be uh, covering in the presentation uh, in upcoming slides. Now, we have understood that uh, the surface water system has been created by nature with a purpose. Uh, there is a complete uh, requirement, there is a need, there is a logic behind creation of uh, these um, surface water systems. And primarily all surface water bodies uh, are sweet in nature, by and large. That is what we understand. Yes, there are salt water lakes which are landlocked also uh, there are salt water uh, streams also which are there uh, you can call them rivers you can call them rivulet but uh, there is a specific purpose for all these water life forms so this is a new ecosystem there's a new biome there is a new biosphere right now let us also understand what exactly is water and how is water different from rest all the phenomena all the substances all the uh, um, ecosystems of uh, life on water uh, on uh, the planet so these are some of uh, the recent uh, discoveries or uh, the scientific discoveries that we have seen across the globe uh, certain things that we always understand that uh, water is the only exceptional Substance, if you call it a substance, uh, which will expand when it is condensed. Rest everything, uh, once frozen, will uh, get condensed, which uh, everything will contract. Whereas water is the only thing which expands. Water exists in solid, liquid and gas. Uh, water is H2O, which is uh, two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen. Both of them are inflammable. Both of them are flammable gases. Uh, but they unite together to form water, which is a fire extinguisher. Right, so the the complete uh, the property of the system is changing. Okay, uh, now water has got a beyond force, uh, due to which uh, we all know the Archimedes principle because of which the ships sail, and uh, this works against the gravity. Right, then um, there was. Uh, uh, research done by Dr. Victor Schaubeger in Austria, uh, somewhere in, uh, he, he's done a lot of work on uh, the movement of water. Um, and he, uh, for the first time, documented and uh, presented it to his respective university that water does not, does not flow straight. It moves spirally. So the spiral motion is the cause of the creation of whirlpools into the river. Uh, similarly, there was a lot of uh, research done by Mr. Marasu Imoto in Japan, uh, which was to understand uh, the response of the water to the environment around it. So he uh, took some water in a pan and put it into a slaughterhouse. Uh, same water, same tap. He uh, collected some water and he put it into a monastery. And then he created water crystals out of these waters by leaving them for 24 hours in their respective environment. And these water crystals were actually giving him an idea that how is water responding to the environment in which it has been kept, right? So uh, all his research would be available on uh, internet. You can just go on to YouTube and search for Dr. Marasu Emota and you'll get uh, all uh, sorts of videos. 
Then there was uh, Dr. Jacques Bonvani from France, who did a lot of research in 80s uh, and early 90s on memory of water. Uh, and then finally, uh, we get Dr. Luc Anthony Mont Montier from France, who's a Nobel laureate. Uh, his picture is available on your slide right now. Uh, he did a water memory uh, experiment in 2014, recorded it on camera end to end, and it is available on YouTube. You can just uh, log on to this uh, particular link, which has been given on your slide, uh, which proves that water listens, records, communicates, memorizes, and translates. Everything can be done by water. And the, I'll, I'll tell you about the experiment. What he did was... He took tap water uh, in uh, Paris and he added uh, a strand of a uh, DNA which was infected with HIV. He got the Nobel Prize for uh, discovering the HIV virus only. Uh, so this was something very, very unusual. You cannot find in any water anywhere. So this was deliberately done so that uh, it doesn't get replicated anywhere. And then uh, from a, a 100 ml test tube in which this uh, DNA strand was added, he took one drop and then added to a fresh test tube of fresh water. Uh, then again, one drop from there to another test tube. So this was repeated 24 times. Now the 24 dilution is uh, mathematically, theoretically, uh, logically, it is equivalent to one drop in an ocean. Now, this last test tube, which is almost equivalent to one drop in an ocean, he put it into a, a particular device, which could record the, uh, uh, the radiations coming out of this particular sample. So, he recorded that, uh, converted that into a wave file. And from Paris, it was emailed to another set of doctors who were waiting in Milan, in Italy, where it was downloaded from the net because it had come as an attachment to the email. And this wave file uh, was played on a speaker system in front of which there was fresh water from a tap in Milan. And uh, that test tube was made to listen to this wave file uh, for about three hours. After that, this test tube was taken out and uh, they put uh, that uh, uh, there is a binder substance which can recreate a DNA. Uh, this is usually used by the forensic experts to find out the DNA of um, a person on a crime scene. So he, uh, I mean, the set of uh, scientists in Milan actually put that binder into it and they were able to recreate the same HIV infected DNA in Milan. So that means water was able to listen, what was water was able to record and communicate, memorize and translate all the memories in Milan. So this has all been proven by modern science. These are the latest discoveries on water. And this is what is uh, been our uh, experience. I mean, it's not just uh, something theoretical. So this is how water is different from any other available substance on the planet. And that is why we don't call water as a substance. It is rather a living ecosystem, which is to give a lot of ecosystem services to the vicinity in which water body is. So now look at uh, the solution approach. Uh, what is the impact of water in urban and rural landscapes uh, for which we will have to understand the concept of ecosystem services from water. So uh, the ecosystem services from water bodies and wetlands are immense. So let's understand uh, we, we have categorized into three uh, different segments. Uh, for which we need to be very, very clear that water bodies are not just pool or reservoir of water, but an ecosystem service provider. And the moment we establish this, we will actually be uh, working towards a sustainable solution for solving the water stress across the globe. 
So the first kind of services is what we call as mitigation services. If the water bodies are healthy, if the water bodies are performing their uh, ecosystem services, the first set of services that you get from sheer existence of a fresh and healthy water body is air pollution mitigation, water pollution mitigation, flood, drought, and water logging mitigation, vector and waterborne disease prevention. There will be no outbreak of vector and waterborne diseases if the water bodies are healthy, right? Uh, so how does all this happen? Uh, starting from the air pollution, water bodies are uh, the, the landlocked water bodies. Uh, they all have top surface, which is negatively charged and largely the air pollution that we uh, call as the PM 2.5, PM 5 and PM 10. And these particulate matter are largely positively charged. So they naturally get attracted to the top surface of the water body. In the polluted state, water bodies are actually emitters of greenhouse gases. But in a healthy state, water bodies are carbon sinks. So they'll be doing uh, carbon sequestration. Why does it happen is that gives you the another answer of water pollution mitigation. Basically, every water body has got an aquatic food chain. So they're a single-celled organism. They perform the metabolic activity, which helps the production of planktons. Planktons are in themselves, they're the feed for the larger organisms like uh, fishes and turtles. And they excrete is ammonia, which is again uh, the feed for uh, the single-celled organism. So the single-celled organism, if they are alive and kicking, they are performing the metabolic activity, they'll be neutralizing ammonia uh, by uh, uh, separating uh, or decomposing uh, ammonia. Right Now, uh, water bodies uh, in the bottom have got uh, soil. So they create a soil capillary and this soil capillary will link the aquifer, underground aquifer and the surface water body due to which... Uh, when there is uh, too much of rain during monsoon, uh, the aquifer will be recharged. And when there is a high rate of evaporation during peak of summer, the water will be pulled up from the aquifer and uh, the water level into the water body will be maintained. So flood, drought and water logging mitigation in the vicinity is by default done uh, in this phenomena. Uh, then uh, the the vector and the waterborne diseases which uh, happen around uh, the vicinity. If the water body is contaminated, if the water is decaying, that uh, adds to a lot of uh, viscosity of water. When the water has got a high viscosity, the mm, uh, the waves will be compromised, and still water is the best breeding ground for the mosquitoes. That is how the uh, influx of uh, the vector borne diseases happen around the water body. And if the water is contaminated, there will be anaerobic life, which will be uh, disease causing microbial life. Uh, and if anybody comes in contact with water, that will uh, spread the water borne diseases. So if the water bodies are healthy, the viscosity will be maintained and uh, the water uh, will always have natural waves due to which uh, vector borne diseases uh, would not happen and if uh, the aquatic food chain is maintained obviously uh, the anaerobic life will not uh, uh, propagate in water and that is how waterborne diseases will be mitigated so these are the mitigation services similarly we have conservation services and we have maintenance services uh, so all these are the ecosystem services from the water body and due to uh, these ecosystem services, water bodies contribute a lot in the vicinity uh, in different forms. So whatever I've explained is uh, let, let us understand all these in the practical reality with some case studies. So the case study one is from Varanasi, uh, which is Kabir Prakatya Stali, Lehertara Lake, Old Kabir Mat, Marwadi. Uh, Varanasi. This was the lake in which Sant Kabir was found in 1498 and that is why it has got an uh, heritage and archaeological importance. So it is maintained by uh, the archaeological directorate of the state of Uttar Pradesh in India and uh, this was the condition before uh, we started the project. Uh, back in 1498 probably this entire area was a wetland because this side we have uh, river Varuna and this side we have river Ganga. 
and this was a flood plain of both the rivers so all that excess water used to come into this area you can see there are very small small water bodies all around but this area is largely encroached you can see a densely populated colony here so this water body used to receive untreated sewage from 20000 homes and it was in pathetic condition it was actually not a water body it was only uh, left as a collection of sewage and from this condition when we uh, started doing the treatment uh, let me just uh, take you along with uh, uh, the what was uh, the pre treatment condition uh, there was a massive foul smell all across the vicinity. You could understand that you are entering the vicinity of the lake uh, from about almost a kilometer. You can see there are no waves into this complete water body. Uh, you can see the patches of uh, algal bloom, uh, fungal growth, uh, smudge and sludge. The top surface is completely opaque. You cannot see, uh, see what is there beneath. There was a massive mosquito population, almost in trillions. And you can see this newly built surface is also beneath water. So that was the level of water. Uttar Pradesh Pollution Control Board had an estimate that almost seven feet of sludge was there in the bottom. And uh, the daily inlet was 10 million liters of untreated sewage. That was creating this uh, massive problem. Uh, another thing which you can observe is there is no life around the water body. That person who was sitting was uh, uh, from uh, our uh, crew only who captured this video. So there was nobody who used to walk into this water body because you could not uh, sit next to the water body even for two minutes. Massive mosquito population was there. So that was also a disturbing factor. And apart from that, uh, the uh, the water body was in such a pathetic condition that every monsoon it used to overflow. And every peak of summer, it used to uh, get completely dry, dry to the extent that kids could actually play into the water body. So this was the pre-treatment condition in October 21. November 21, the treatment started. So this is... Just a difference of three days. 19th of November, the treatment started. 22 of November is this video. You can see uh, on 19th of November, there was no waves. 22nd of November, there are waves all across the water body. Second is you see the color difference. The color is lighter on 22nd, darker on 19th. Now, we move on to about two weeks, 10 days. The transparency of water has happened to the extent that you can actually see, see through the water. Whereas the top surface was completely opaque on 19. On 29th, you can actually see through the water. The bottom organic deposits are clearly visible. So that's the difference in a matter of three days. Now, after two weeks, you can also see that the water level is receding. Now, water volume is not reducing, but the water level is receding. Why it is happening is because the bottom organic deposits are getting decomposed due to the microbial activity, uh, the metabolic activity of the native microbiota. And this decomposition is actually consuming uh, the sludge. And that is why sludge is uh, being removed and the space is being reclaimed by water. The water volume remained the same, but the top surface is receding. And all that algal bloom that you uh, saw in the beginning were all deposited on these uh, stairs. So after one month of treatment, this was the condition. You can see that the DO level has gone up by 102%. And that what uh, that's what created the headline for a local newspaper, Danik Jagran. That for the first time in recorded history, the dissolved oxygen level of a water body in Varanasi is higher than that of River Ganga itself. Right? Almost all the parameters have changed. The fecal coliform, total coliform, E. coli, um, salinity, everything has changed. Um, but uh, DO had gone up by 102%. So that is what created the headline. Now, this is the video of summers wherein you can see kids are playing. Uh, they have created a boat and they are just boating around. Then they'll be swimming around. And uh, the complete water body is full of waves. 
there are waves all across the the life was back there was a lot of aquatic life a lot of birds and you see the water table has gone down to the extent that this entire platform which was submerged under water is now completely out of water so that's how the water body has transformed and all this has happened in c2 conditions there was not even a single drain which was coming into the water body has been diverted or stopped so all that over nutrient overload which was coming in was all consumed in the aqua ecology and the water is fresh enough the footfall has increased the circular economy has gone up uh, that has been created by the water body itself now uh, there are vendors sitting next to the water body because they're getting a lot of business they're getting a lot of footfall and all that has happened uh, because of the nature uh, working along with you. So these were the changes in uh, suspended solids, pH, COD, BOD, salinity, DO and hardness. Uh, why you see fluctuation is only because the treatment is 100% in situ. So whatever drains are coming in, that 10 MLD of sewage untreated is still coming in. And the water body is learning to consume and digest it over a period of time due to the treatment. Now, coming on to the case study two, which uh, uh, Dr. Pankaj mentioned uh, in, uh, before the opening of the presentation also. This is Amrit Sarovar project of Moradabad. Uh, for those who do not understand what is Moradabad, it is the brass capital of the country. Um, almost every uh, household, uh, they are doing some or the other work of brass. So by that virtue, what happens is even the domestic sewage is actually industrial effluent because the metal work is happening and uh, everybody is uh, doing something or the other with the brass. So uh, that is why even from the domestic sewage, you get a lot of heavy metals coming out uh, of the home. And all uh, that wastewater is coming into the water body. In the entire state of Uttar Pradesh. Uh, no, I'll just show you a small video which will explain how uh, the treatment started and how the just a pool or reservoir of the wastewater which was filled completely with the sludge. It cannot be technically called a water body. Uh, this was just a pool of the wastewater. And you can see uh, the pre treatment condition. This is all water body, which you can see here, uh, in the records of the administration. This is all a water body. But this is completely filled with sludge and smudge. And you can see these, these boys are actually playing around with whatever amount of wastewater which has been collected here. So this was all excavated physically. And after the excavation also, what was used for filling it up was wastewater only because uh, the outlets, the outfall of the wastewater was already created for this particular space. And that is how it was refilled. After excavation, it was filled with all wastewater from all across the city. And uh, this was nothing but a pool of uh, untreated sewage. And sewage also in Muradabad is actually an industrial effluent, right? So this is how it was collected and the treatment started. You can see uh, the fog layer is there. So into our treatment, what we do is we study the water body. We make a medicine, which is 100% botanical extract. And this medicine is uh, tailor-made for one particular water body. And then it is amalgamated with fresh water from the same agroclimatic zone poured into the water body early morning at the time of sunrise. During the day when the sun is up, photons are available. This entire medicine is synthesized by the aqua ecology and the resurrection process starts. So here what you can see is uh, the color is changing a little bit. And uh, with a regular treatment, things will completely transform into the water body. You can see the fog layer is uh, getting disseminated. Uh, you can also see that the froth is reducing. Froth is depicting the amount of phosphates which are there uh, into the 
uh, water and that is how the on the the treatment water is responding to the water body <coughs> so you can also see a lot of greenery uh, coming back in place because the water quality is changing so that's the overall impact now you can also see some birds flying uh, for which you can see the reflection in the water so the water quality is changing it is calling uh, for the ecological restoration the mosquitoes the foul smell everything is gone the number of birds is increasing the amount of greenery is increasing now the transformed water is also being used to uh, do a foliar spray on the embankment uh, vegetation which actually transforms uh, the embankment uh, area also. So this transformed water is basically uh, because it is a natural water, it is highly oxygenated. It's got a huge amount of aquatic life into it. It has got a complete uh, electrolyte balance. So there are a lot of uh, the micro uh, nutrients which are there into this water. And that is why this water, when used for irrigation, this uh, does an exemplary effect onto the vegetation on the embankment area. So this is how the water body gets transformed. Now you can see uh, all these uh, trees. They don't have a, even a single leaf on them. But all these are the birds. Birds have made them uh, into their own habitat. And eventually, all these trees have become uh, so green that people take shelter under them during uh, the rains. Right. So that is the impact, overall impact on ecology, just by restoring the quality of water. You can see the the number of birds which are there. Right. All this has happened because natural water is restored. There is a absolute uh, imbalance of electrolyte into the water so it is a fresh water there is an aquatic food chain which exists into the water body and that's only transformed the water so what we got in Muradabad is six different water bodies in the same city and that is why uh, we got a massive impact in the overall city environment so the uh, the key parameters are water quality air quality groundwater and biodiversity this is how the water quality transformed. Uh, this is uh, the factor of pH from acidic, it went to alkaline. Suspended solids, as I said, uh, yeah. even the domestic uh, uh, water, uh, domestic sewage is actually an industrial effluent because you don't get this kind of suspended solids into the uh, sewage anywhere. And this is between 5,000 to 6,000 and drop down to sub 100 that is why it is looking zero into the graph because the graph is in thousands and what we have brought down is below 100. Then we have the chemical oxygen demand uh, which again is an industrial effluent parameter when you have 6000 plus as uh, uh, the COD and that is below 30 today that is why it is uh, appearing to be zero. Uh, the BOD uh, was between 2,500 to 3,000 and that is below detectable limit in most of uh, the water bodies now. This is about the air pollution uh, where you can see all these uh, pointers are actually showing the water body and these are the air um, quality monitoring towers installed by the pollution control board. Uh, so this is uh, May of 22. For consistent uh, five years from 2017 to uh, 2022 the water quality uh, the air quality of the city was 300 plus which in last uh, i mean uh, after treatment for seven months uh, it has uh, been uh, uh, in the uh, acceptable limits and uh, for almost 300 days now it has been sub 80, which is a good uh, quality of air uh, as per the standards. And uh, this is about uh, the groundwater recharge. 
from 2009 till 2021, the groundwater was consistently depleting. For the first time, uh, it got recorded in 2022 mm -hmm. after three months of uh, running of the treatment that uh, there was a positive impact into the uh, mm -hmm. groundwater. There was a 10th of July 2023, it uh, rained uh, massive uh, in uh, North India. In uh, Delhi, it was 153 mm of rains and uh, Dr. Pankaj would know that half of the Delhi was flooded. So this is also a, a mitigation plan of urban floods uh, for which Dr. Pankaj Gupta is an expert. Uh, but uh, the same day, in uh, when it rained 153 mm in Delhi, it rained 160 mm in Maradabad. Not even a single water body had a single drop of overflow. Uh, into the biodiversity conservation, uh, WWF team was there uh, with 380 participants. This is a snapshot from their website only. The link is given below. Uh, wherein uh, they got uh, this uh, delegate of over 300 people and they explained how the uh, maintaining the health of the water body contributes toward the biodiversity conservation. Uh, again, there is uh, a massive uh, drop into uh, the vector-borne disease cases post-monsoon. Uh, the data is being investigated by uh, Public Health Engineering Department of uh, the District of Maradabad. Now, there are a few more case studies which uh, I can just uh, just to brief uh, give you a brief. I can uh, I'm I'm just showing you the pictures of pre and post. So first one is Ahmedabad, that is Gujarat. Sonipat is Haryana. Uh, Kolkata is West Bengal. Guwahati is Assam, that is northeast of India. Uh, then Katak is uh, Odisha. Ujjain is Madhya Pradesh. Ayodhya is Uttar Pradesh, and Puri is again Odisha. So you can see all sorts of transformation from. Uh, no water to high water, from high sand to no high sand, from completely green algal bloom kind of water to a natural water body. Uh, so all sorts of transformations have happened. And once these kind of transformation happens and the ecosystem services are restored, then the water body becomes an asset for the vicinity. Now, uh, just to give you a brief about uh, just by restoring the uh, health of the water body, how it solves the urban and the rural problem. Uh, the, the five key problems that we have in all, all almost all the cities across the globe is sewage problem, water bodies are getting polluted, air pollution is increasing, drinking water availability is a problem, aquifer is, uh, I mean, the water table is going down. Uh, there, there are plenty of places where in, even the aquifer is saline. So all those problems can be sorted just by restoring the health of the water bodies. And the additional benefit that you get is the carbon credit because every natural water body in a healthy condition is a blue carbon sink. Same goes true with the rural problem also. You can get uh, the, the industrial effluent collected into the water body and the water body can be treated, uh, brought back to uh, the natural water condition wherein it becomes a source for irrigation as well as for the animal husbandry, right? And of course, uh, carbon trading is a bonus. So here it, it is a case study of a sustainable agriculture wherein what we have done is we have collected the sewage from, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the industrial effluent from a rice mill, uh, which produces uh, the kind of toxic uh, water, which if you use into the fertile land, it will go infertile. And uh, here there was a, a unique case for us because... Uh, across the road, there was a rice mill. Uh, here, I'll just pause the video and I'll just show it to you. This is the rice mill. Um, this is uh, the cow shed and this is a 32 acres farm. Uh, so what we did was uh, we asked them to collect uh, the wastewater from rice mill and slurry from uh, the biogas plant into this pond, which is half an acre pond. And uh, we treated the water here and to transform the water into uh, neuroimmuno booster for plants and animals. The same water was used uh, for agriculture and they got a massive yield. Uh, he's the owner of the farm. Uh, is he audible? Is it a video? Extra benefit. Huh? 
हम जो राइस मिल का गंदा पानी हम जो यूज कर रहे हैं यू लिसन टू द ऑडियो हम एक पाउंड बना के इसका yes. yes. और Yes, yeah, sorry. There was a disruption because of my dog. So that was uh, the case study of sustainable agriculture from uh, Chhattisgarh, Central India. So these are the kind of revenues which can be generated out of uh, the. restoration of the ecosystem services from the water bodies and bringing them back to good health water credit sanitation credit emission credit and uh, dr prakash would be able to explain in detail on these subjects so these are some of the awards that has been received uh, by this technology that we call as economic technology and uh, there are four central ministries which recognize uh, our contribution and they have awarded us so we are a technology partner to mission uh, mission amrut 2.0 which is atal mission for rejuvenation and urban transformation by ministry of housing and urban affairs government of india and uh, we've been awarded the esg enabler technology of the year 2023 award by new and renewable energy uh, think you are frozen madhukar ji i think something happened i got disconnected i don't know uh, the the meeting got over or something no no you were frozen and then you suddenly disconnected so do you want to share once again no just a second maybe because of connectivity yeah i guess uh, there was some uh, problem into the net connectivity i guess let me just share it once mm -hmm. again so it was almost uh, end of the presentation only mm -hmm. yeah that's okay you can share the screen and then we'll conclude well while you say the screen i must say uh, uh, oh screen is there okay go ahead yeah, yeah so uh, i think i was on this screen so yes. these were the awards which have been received by us uh, since 2019 uh four central ministries have given us award and uh, there is civil society award also there is uh, state awards also from state of uttar pradesh uh, we've been uh, a ted speaker so we got an award of idea was spreading by ted also and the smart water magazine spain has uh, they, they conduct a uh, yearly global survey of uh, the authors who are giving their articles to the magazine and they have ranked us uh, number 2 uh, in september this year uh, 2021 for the first time when they uh, conducted these awards we were number 
and uh, since then we have uh, remained in top five and that's uh, a real transformation uh, again from Oradabad case study only uh, the pre and the post uh, you can see the dumping yard getting transformed into a absolutely lush green uh, scenario and uh, the uh, the Varanasi project that uh, I showcased uh, that the first case study that was awarded as the finest uh, 50 global case studies uh, by Smart Water and Waste World magazine. So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, uh, you can uh, come back with your queries and the questions if you have any. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Madhukarji, uh, for sharing such a nice uh, experience, activities. Uh, I must say our CIE members will forget what you said and what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And, and and in science, when we work on field, especially, we we have to have differentiation between satisfaction and pleasure. And you clearly define the difference between satisfaction and the pleasure. And, and the, the alacrity and, and the, the concept you discussed with the pleasure, uh, that gives a boost to our CIE members how they can work on the field for a better, for a better, uh, I can say pleasure, not a satisfaction. So uh, definitely they will remember what you made them feel. So thank you very much for your experience, for your um, the work you have been doing from last um, many years and decades now. And, and I wish you a great health and prosperity to do that so that we researchers can learn from you as well. So with that, uh, I will, I will, uh, moderate the questions in the in the chat box i see a couple of questions there uh one is by devdatji devdatji you can unmute yourself or you can ask or i can ask on behalf of you also so if you are there devdatji you can unmute yourself the question is uh, please explain the movement of water against gravity other than capillary movement of the water and movement of the water against Archimedes principle. You have told that there is a memory of water or the water bodies. Please explain because till now, the latest nature report shows memory in some water bodies without nerve cells. Okay. I'm not aware of the nerve cells in water. <laughs> but what I was talking about is, I, I explained uh, the complete uh, experiment of Dr. Uh, Luke Montier. Uh, which was conducted on camera and uh, the link is uh, was also given into uh, the presentation you can simply uh, go on to youtube and search for uh, the water experiment by dr lok monti and you will get the complete one and a half hour video available on youtube that will explain you the concept of memory of water as far as uh, the movement of water uh, against gravity is concerned uh, the the capillary uh, action is uh, the capillary force is uh, basically movement uh, from a high concentration to lower concentration that we all know right uh, now when uh, the surface water bodies are above soil technically if you actually look at it soil is designed by nature to be above water not below water so uh, uh, into the landlocked water bodies uh, when soil is below water and the water movement happens that grinds uh, the soil beneath uh, the water and uh, this transforms soil into the nanoparticle that we call as silt. Now silt being lower in density that will percolate down between the layers of soil and when it is getting percolated down water will follow because it's a water body. So uh, you know if, if there is a cavity uh, in uh, the crust, you will find underground caves which has got uh, three uh, structures, stalactite, stalagmite and pillars. Why do these uh, get created? It is only because water is carrying a lot of minerals along and uh, those mineral deposits are creating the stalactites, stalag uh, stalagmites and uh, the pillars. Right. So that is just the mineral deposit because of the movement of water. Now, because of these uh, soil capillaries, uh, there is a link established between the surface water body and the underground aquifer, which creates 
these capillaries and uh, the movement of water in the capillary will depend upon where exactly the pressure is higher. So into uh, the, the period of monsoon when it is raining heavily, uh, you are getting a lot of pressure onto the surface water body. So the aquifer recharge will happen or what we call as rainwater harvesting. And reverse of it will happen during peak of uh, summer when the evaporation rate is high, the uh, pressure into the aquifer is high. So this water will be pulled up to the surface water body and the water level in the water body will be maintained, which means the surface water body goes perennial. It will neither ever dry during peak of summers nor it will ever overflow during peak of monsoons. So that is the movement. I think I missed the remediation principle. Please explain how economics technology works. Okay. Uh, economics technology is basically a nature-based solution. How we work is we, uh, we study the water body. We make a medicine which is 100% botanical extract. This can be made only after the study is conducted. Like which agroclimatic zone is the water body? What kind of contamination is coming in? What is the volume of contamination coming in? If there is any life into the water body or not, uh, are is there any foul smell? Because all these are indications. So what kind of vegetations are there on the embankment area? So all these factors are to be taken into consideration. That conducts uh, that constitutes the complete study. And based on this study, we make a medicine which is hundred percent botanical extract. Now, what herbs to choose? What portion of which particular plant is to be taken is all dependent on this study. Now, after the study, this medicine is made, which medicine is basically a concentrated form. It cannot be used directly in any of the water bodies because, you know, uh, the principle of medicine or poison is just about concentration. Uh, snake venom can kill people. In a lower concentration, it is used for making cancer medicine that we all know. We are all uh, uh, science uh, people. So, uh, this concentrated medicine is shipped to the location where it is amalgamated with fresh water from the same agroclimatic zone. And then uh, this dilution ratio or the amalgamation ratio is also explained when it is shipped to the location. And then it is poured into the water body early morning at the time of sunrise uh, so that there is a homogeneous mix of uh, the medicine that happens across the water body uh, in next uh, one or two hours uh, because when the sun is up, photons are available. This entire medicine is synthesized by the aquaecology and the resurrection process starts. So the entire treatment is divided into three phases. Phase one is resurrection where the native microbiota which has gone into dormancy is resurrected. Second phase is restoration where the bottom sludge deposit is consumed. And the third phase is rejuvenation where the digestion capacity of the surface water body is calibrated with the fresh incoming load. So that's the complete uh, working principle of economic technology. Madhukarji, uh, especially for my consumption, uh, the medicine you are uh, making or the botanicals, uh, are you selling that as well for community or those who are interested to do similar activities? No, we are not selling a product. We are basically uh, selling the uh, services, I would say, because just by giving you uh, a product uh, doesn't serve the purpose at all because we need to be consistently observing the reaction of the water body. Uh, you know, it's like how well it is being received by the water body and what kind of tweaking is required to be done because uh, in three phases, the, uh, the medicine has to change. But in every phase also, depending upon the acceptability of the water body, uh, there is some tweaking which is required to be done. So it's not um, a kind of uh, off-the-shelf available product which can be shipped to uh, a customer and they can do it on their own. This is not DIY. <laughs> this is a complete end-to-end -end, uh, interaction uh, commitment In that because sense, we're dealing with life. We, we, yeah. So in that sense, there's no standard or standardization for any kind of medicine which can be approved by any agency. So it is in-house, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we applied for a patent, but that patent is also a process patent. That's not uh, the concoction patent. I mean, there's, there's no fixed formula for the concoction. It all depends upon the conditions of the water body. As I said, I mean, we need to be uh, conducting a detailed study of the water body. 
and then we have to be observant all uh, along with the project uh, but yes once all the three phases are complete then the water body can be left on its own like uh, the first example that i gave uh, as a case study the kabir prakatis thali in varanasi uh, the treatment stopped in november 22 after one year uh, of beginning of the project and uh, this year uh, there was a national uh, conference for uh, school of planning and architecture all the architects and town planners who uh, were called in for it, almost uh, a delegation of uh, 60, 65 people were there into uh, IIT BHU. We were called in for a lecture and then we took this entire delegation to uh, the Lehertara Lake and they were zapped to see that in spite of complete one year of no intervention at all, the water body was able to sustain itself. There was huge amount of aquatic life into it. Um, there was good number of fishes and turtles and there were ducks and there were birds and bees and butterflies. Everything was there. Even after one year of leaving it on its own. So that's the impact. Excellent. excellent. Uh, suppose there's a high nitrate in water body, then what are the constituents of the medicines? See, it's not just one factor. There, there's so many factors which are required to be taken into consideration. Yes, uh, uh, it can be ammonia, it can be nitrate, it can be phosphate, it can be uh, nitrite, uh, it can be uh, sulfates. Right? So all these things have to be taken into consideration and then uh, because there is a pool of 1008 herbs out of which we have to pick and choose which exactly is the factor for which particular thing. Like I'll give you one simple uh, thing which almost everybody would understand who is there from the water industry that the entire globe is trying to treat water only with three processes coagulation uh, coagulation flocculation and aeration right these are all uh, physical parameters right uh, again if you broadly categorize there could be a physical intervention chemical intervention or biological intervention where so what we understand is a physical or chemical problem it's a mix of all of them put together right so the the treatment strategy also has to be a holistic strategy wherein there'll be changes on physical layer chemical layer and biological layer but overall the approach has to be ecological because if you just pick and choose of one particular domain you'll be solving only a limited portion of the problem now that's what we call as not solving the problem but postponing the problem right like if you uh, look at the stp or the etp strategy what they're doing is they're passing the water through filter collecting the sludge now what to do with the sludge is another problem if you look at the approach of air pollution what people are doing is they 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 they're installing the smog towers now smog tower is co collecting the particulate matter now what to do with this particulate matter is yet another problem right so these are not holistic or sustainable approaches because these are dependent on number one energy number two equipments now the more mechanical equipments you have in place the more points of failures you have right so you cannot put the entire city on a ventilator right you the, the obvious expectation of the environment is that people breathe normally without any uh, mechanical support right so the right approach is that you restore the cycle because in nature, there is no concept of wealth or waste, right? We attach value to something and we call it a wealth. We detach that value and we call it a waste, right? In nature, there is no such concept. Waste of one organism is wealth for another. Like one good example is uh, the excreta of the bird. The bird droppings, they, they are actually... Uh, toxic for the bird that is why it is excreted out naturally right but if it falls onto the soil it will create jungle if it falls into the water body it will create planktons right mm -hmm. so waste of one is actually wealth for another so that's how this the complete focus has to be on reinstation of this cyclic process and that is precisely what has been our agenda right and then with a the, with the limited understanding of instrumentation and testing in the lab, we always see in the lens of those instruments and instrumentation or, or testing in the lab. So I see especially huge potential of 
young students who can explore uh, the complex phenolic compounds of those botanicals, what you have, what are the impacts of those on natural resilient systems. So they can do a lot of study as, that, as well. So, yeah, definitely. I think uh, with that, we will we will conclude uh, today's talk. And and I, I see Dr. Pankaj Gupta is here. So yeah, I you. have. Uh, thank you, Prakash. I have one uh, uh, question to Madhukarji. Uh, before that, I would like to add uh, one thing uh, for Anurag. Uh, dear Anurag, it's really good. You know, in India and around the globe, people are talking a lot of about solution. Uh, for example, solution for pollutants, solution for water bodies, and solution for air, and so on. But uh, see, first we have to understand the system. And what is good here, the Madhukarji is trying best to understand the system first and then designing some kind of uh, liquid or some kind of medicine, whatever he calls, uh, for this uh, remediation. So, uh, see, once we will understand correctly or uh, you can say in a precise way our ecosystem, uh, it's it's a very easy to remediate or regulate the processes. I am practicing the same uh, high, like same principle at a highly contaminated site, and I am really happy to say uh, we are receiving a, such a wonderful result over there. So um, uh, the site is uh, contaminated by chromium. It's a it's a toxic hazardous uh, chemical, and. Uh, just by applying a local uh, available material you can see in the village we don't have a lot of things so just applying by lock, uh, available local material we we are able to solve a lot of problem over there so uh, having a great having a good study about the system is uh, always good to have uh, further remediation follow-up remediation mm -hmm. now over to you madhukarji how many research uh, student are working with you, not your uh, crew member, the research scholar, PDF uh, scholars, and early scientists. See, every project has got a different um, involvement. Uh, what uh, Dr. Jha was saying that uh, uh, lab testing is required. That that is a integral part of almost every no, no. project. I have asked this I direct have... question because now yes. this Yahi member is now your a pool of researchers. If you yeah. wish to train uh, our Siahi member uh, about the processes, if you if you would like to demonstrate live uh, in field. Uh, I'm sure the, a large pool of members uh, will be happy and will join you. Uh, in, no, in, in. So, uh, as uh, we have discussed earlier, there are a good number of projects which are going to start now in yes. which uh, we have proposed it to the customer. See, uh, first and foremost, the customer also has to be ready that uh, the data uh, from his project is going to go out for research. So we have to convince uh, the customer also to the extent that, okay, we're going to involve people into research and this, uh, uh, maybe your case study will be published in some scientific journal internationally. So the customer also has to be convinced. Now, fortunately for us, uh, there is going to be a set of projects which will be starting in uh, upcoming months, wherein uh, that permission has already been secured. Uh, that we'll be collecting all that empirical data in terms of the water quality, air quality, groundwater, um, the changes which are happening, uh, the, the carbon data, the uh, the water credit, the sanitation credit, emission credit. Because, you know, uh, most of the people will be skeptical about sharing that data that, okay, my water body was em uh, emanating so much amount of greenhouse gases, right? Uh, because that will be uh, a legal uh, impact also on to the urban local body. So we need to take those permissions. And uh, fortunately, we have uh, secured uh, some of the projects with those permissions. And uh, we'll definitely uh, remain in touch and we'll keep you posted upon when exactly those projects are starting. And then we can take uh, all the researchers along. And there'll be a, a lot of data available for the researchers, for the PhD scholars. They can uh, actually do their uh, PhD on those subjects also. Yeah, great. Right. So, yeah, great. So actually, initially, when uh, our team was discussing about uh, the field scale practice talk, the objective was to attach our CIAHI members to the field practitioners. 
so i wish ke in future if you are going to demonstrate something new uh, yeah. please uh, let us know we will circulate the information uh, among our members yeah he member and then we will try to we will try to attach your work with sia uh, he member right uh, so over to you prakash you have to do that attachment is one aspect for long term understanding for young scholars there is a new trend of capacity building from agencies like nsf and dst also they are moving towards bottom up approach for research funding now what is bottom up approach for young scholars those who are here to understand the problem at the ground then define objectives based on the team like madhukar ji is leading and then make a collaborative project to submit a, a grant so recently dst has started and nsf is starting uh, in multiple countries collaboration with different countries as well so it's called bottom up science engagement projects and it's million dollar funding coming up with uh, en an engagement of different agencies different uh, ngos and getting a sustainable solutions for ground work and that's how we need to understand what what the series we are doing for practitioners that will help in uh, building a narrative among young scholars that uh, the research grant can be built based on based on the bottom up approach what you are doing rather than doing uh, theory objectives and then imposing solutions to the uh, you know real stakeholders and that is a major problem especially in hydrology and agriculture we do not try to understand the problem of growers when they say grower means farmers and then practitioners and then we suddenly uh, whatever we did in phd we try to understand and then we write grant and then we submit grant and then uh, publish paper that's fine publishing is another aspect you can do good for your promotion but there is a growing trend of uh, funds and grants on bottom up approach and that's why our goal uh, for this uh, series is to make a narrative or build a narrative among young scholars so that they can uh, feel that um, there is some part where we can integrate our phd learning or research learning into the problem solving and that's called bottom up approach and and you can google it a lot of funding agencies are coming up with bottom up approach and that is the goal of uh, short term goal is good for attaching few people with your research plan but long term goal is for capacity building of narrative among young minds so that they can develop some thing based on the, those problems so yeah so there is a nice comment by uh, anurag we must uh, appreciate the talk by uh, madhukar ji and what a doctor yes yeah what a doctor <laughs> so, so so i think madhukar ji has already been awarded uh, the water hero i think now from ministry of water resources what a hero yeah with that uh, i think we are yeah we have crossed the time also so with that we'll close the session today and then this in this series we will have another practitioner and then uh, every month we will have one practitioner from different areas and then we'll talk more on how we can integrate um, research into the practice as well so i always advocate about r and d uh, especially we focus more on r and less on d so uh, in r and d it should be reverse d should be first and then our our so yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we'll will work on that as well next month we will have a australian professor who is working in restoration so we'll perfect have... perfect so okay. thank you sir thank you for having me it's a lot of uh, yeah it was a great opportunity and uh, wonderful comments and queries i, I love this interaction and would uh, love to get associated with sai for a longer period of time and uh, whenever we have these projects coming up we'll keep you posted anyways we are in touch with uh, dr pankaj gupta so uh, we'll keep uh, the entire forum posted about uh, the upcoming projects now you are in touch with everyone so this this platform the beauty of this platform is we are open to everyone yeah okay. anyone can talk to you anyone can reach to you and you can uh, work and you can support anyone so that's the beauty of our cihe all right right with that i think we'll conclude the session we'll stop Thank recording you. and those who want to stay chat they can stay and chat